Fine. Can everyone see that? Yep. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, hopefully all of you know me, but I'm Tom, one of the CESA trainees. Um, so I was just going to do a session today, just going through about sort of paediatric DKA. Um, so, so my grand plan is we're going to do a little bit about sort of the epidemiology, sort of some of the basic science, but just touch on that. Um, I'm going to mainly sort of focus on the sort of the management and just how we sort of go slightly different from uh, sort of adults, because it's quite different in how we do it. Um, uh, and that's it. So in the UK, so about 36,000 or so uh, children do have uh, type 1 diabetes. Uh, the incidence is about 25 per 100,000. So in our sort of catchment area for sort of the Doncaster borough, um, that means there's probably about 75 new diabetic uh, type 1 cases a year. And they say that sort of roughly 20% of those will present as DKA for their first uh, presentation. So it's not something that we'd see that often. So sort of 20% of 75. So we're going to be looking at sort of one, one to two a month uh, from that side. So it's something that's, you know, not common, but um, is quite important to know a bit about from the sort of initial start and treatment. Um, there's normally sort of two peaks when you'll get the presentations of um, kids coming in. So the first one is sort of early childhood, so sort of six months to five years. Um, and then you get sort of a later peak in puberty um, with sort of most of them coming in that sort of uh, 10 to 14 age category. Uh, from that side is your most common age for presentation. I think you also do get a slight variation throughout the year, so they're not evenly spread. So I think it's sort of autumn time, you do get a slight peak. Um, and I'm not entirely sure whether that's just because they're sort of getting infections as a bit of a trigger uh, from that side um, and sort of setting it off. Fine. So just going on to science stuff. So I'm only going to touch lightly on this. I think most of us sort of know a little bit more about the um, background from a diabetes point. Um, so it's so type one diabetes, which is the main one we're focusing on, because that's uh, the ones that put you into DK. So it's an autoimmune condition that is sort of a progressive destruction of your pancreatic beta cells. Um, and this just leads uh, to a progressive failure of insulin production. And it will sort of progress slightly. So um, initially with your children, when they're sort of first diagnosed, they may have what's called a honeymoon period where they'll still have some uh, of their own insulin production and they may be able to get away with missing doses more than you know once they're sort of fully established and they have that none of that uh, inbuilt uh, production. The lack of insulin then just leads to a bit of a runaway uh, process so you get the gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, you get decreased uptake uh, from the tissues and you get the lipolysis. The high glucose is what leads to the osmotic symptoms and causes the dehydration um, and the high ketones is what leads to the acidosis. Um, so presentation wise, so we've all sort of read the textbooks and probably seen a few of these um, sort of come through the door. Um, so on the left is sort of more, you know, what you might find symptom wise uh, and sort of get a history. Often sort of your first presentations, you know, when sort of speaking to parents, they've sort of noticed some of these, but um, so it's particularly drinking lots but they often just sort of attribute, uh, attribute it to things like um, sort of hot weather um, and they sort of put it off. So they then sort of come in a little bit um, sort of surprised with everything that's going on. Um, things on the right are bits you might uh, sort of pick up from your, your sort of examination or sort of notice um, on that side. Whenever they've presented in um, sort of a DKA situation, always sort of think about what's caused it to happen now um because they may have been sort of uh went high with their sugars for a while so it's just if anything particular has happened that's sort of pushed them into it such as things like infections as well so diagnostic criteria so the main ones are so the ph of less than 7.3 or a bicarbonate of less than 15 uh, and their blood ketones above three so blood sugars will normally be high, but not always uh, from that side. So just, it's one of those just to not be caught out of if their sugars are normal. So other thing to sort of consider when you're sort of seeing a, a kid come in who's you know, high sugars, uh, 
you know, whether it's hyperosmolar or hyperglycemic state. So in those, you typically find the blood sugars can be very high, so potentially over 35. Um, you might not have the, the ketosis either, um, you know, wouldn't expect them to be acidotic. Um, you can get euglycemic uh, DKA, so that's one to just be careful of uh, from that side. So either they've had some you know, partial treatment or their sugars aren't that high. So just need to be aware of that. Um, if you're sort of finding these other features that would sort of be consistent with it, but just not the high sugars. And then the final one would be whether they're actually coming in just with sort of a new presentation and they're not actually in DKA, but they're just sort of running the high sugars. So again, in that you would expect um, raised sugars, but you wouldn't have that acidosis or the ketones present um, from that side. So sort of more going on to sort of management bits, because with us, we obviously aren't going to be managing them as long as we would for, for adults. So they may stay down in the department for a while, but generally with these, we'd sort of get pediatrics involved. So my main focus is going to be on that initial management of the first few hours. Um, so our aims, so what we want to do is correct the fluid deficit. So often due to the osmotic symptoms, they will be quite dry and have got aggressively dehydrated over the sort of preceding sort of couple of days. Um, we also want to resolve the ketosis and control the blood sugars. The idea is if once you can get the ketones to settle there, what's causing the um, acidotic feature from the ketone bodies. So the idea is to drive those down, which is why we will continue their insulin when we're switching them to glucose to sort of really get the ketones settled. Um, whilst we're trying to do these, we're trying to prevent any sort of ongoing side effects. So things we'd be wanting to avoid are cerebral edema, hypokalemia, and hypoglycemia. So these are just based on sort of following um, sort of standard protocol and just making sure we keep an eye out for all these bits as they happen. Um, then finally, so sort of if there's a low GCS, we just need to make sure that um, the risk of things like aspiration are sort of accounted for. Fine. So management. So uh, it differs from adults in how we treat. So particularly, um, they're sort of we're quite restricted in fluid resuscitation. So in adults, as you know, we sort of give them loads of fluid very quickly and aggressively. Um, but before sort of 2020, uh, a child presenting in DK would actually get less fluids than a child who was just on maintenance because of the risk of cerebral edema and the worries from that side. Um, with the recent updates in 2020 and 2021, um, actually it's a lot more liberal in how we can give fluids. Um, there's a delay in starting insulin, so we wouldn't give the uh, bolus dose of, sort of 10 units or anything like that. Uh, we'll put off insulin for a, at least an hour or so before um, starting. We grade the severity based on the pH, and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Uh, we've actually got quite a good performer uh, for it, so I don't know if any of you have seen it, but um, it's quite an easy one to follow. It sort of tells you all the bits to be thinking about. Um, so any patients I'd always get that out uh, for. Um, if you're somewhere that you don't have our performer, um, so there's a British Society of Paediatric and um, Endocrinologists and Diabetic people who have quite a good guideline. And actually there is, is a little bit more update than our current one at the moment. So I'd use our one generally because um, it's our trust-based one. But if you can't find it, there's none in the department, you can't get hold of one or it's somewhere else. Um, then that you can find uh, on the internet and is very good as well. Fine. So sort of initial management wise, um, so let's sort of focus just for this on sort of the bits we need to get done and sort of where, where to do them. So I generally say for all these, you probably want them in recess because uh, they're often quite poorly and if they're not too bad, they do have the potential to deteriorate once you do start treatment. I'd always get sort of senior input and sort of paediatricians are always quite happy to come down early for any of the DKA patients. Um, you want to sort of access for them. So I'd initially go for sort of one access and then we can always look at a second one sort of later on uh, from that side. But when we're getting it, um, so sort of access and bloods off, most important thing would be sort of getting the gas off because that will help us um, confirm the diagnosis. Then we also need to think about sort of things like baseline UNEs. So for a new 
diagnosis one, there's a load of sort of bloods that they'd want doing. So things like your HbA one C, um, things like uh, sort of insulin, C peptide, and bits like that. So generally, from our trust, you'd need to send off a purple, a grey, and four golds. Um, the gold will go to external labs, so that's why you need four of them uh, from that side. So the actual volume of blood you could probably get away with, but because they go to externally um, to get that. If you can't get them or well, they're not bleeding, then that's OK, you know, because we'll have plenty of time to jab them later to get, to get more off. So I'd say first thing is you want the gas because that will at least confirm your diagnosis. Um, if you're moving them across, just while you're getting all this done, just pop them on some oxygen. Um, if you can get a weight for them, it will be useful later on for just working through your calculations and then seeing if you can find the um, uh, perform to get that started because it's quite useful for a memory prompt. So uh, IV access wise, so I've just got on the left here. So these are the gel co cannulas um, that they have for pediatrics. So the difference is that they don't have wings. So they're a little bit more fiddly. So it's worth having a little look about them. So yellow ones are generally for less than one year. Blue ones sort of do most, uh, most of your general kids. Um, I think if you're going to go for pink, you might as well put one of our normal cannulas in because they're a little bit more, more familiar uh, from that side. If, if you're struggling for access, um, what I've got in the picture in the middle is um, an Accuvain. So they'll have these on the peds ward. So if you're speaking to the pediatricians and you know access is looking like it's tricky or we're struggling, if you let them know, they'll bring down an Accuvain, which is like uh, the pediatric equivalent of an ultrasound for getting um, access. Um, and it just means that um, we can sort of speed things up. And then finally, if we are struggling, if we can just get a capillary gas off, um, then that at least allows us to sort of confirm the diagnosis. So if you've not done them before, normally the peds nurses can do them. Uh, if you're doing them yourselves, just make sure there's no air bubbles in the tube because that will just stop them from going through the machine and you'll have to repeat it. So severity of DKA. So this basically guides what we do for sort of treatment and sort of fluids sort of longer term. Um, so we class mild as sort of a pH of 7.2 to 7.29 or a bicarbonate of less than 15. Moderate 7.1 to 7.19 and a bicarbonate of less than 10. So it can be sort of either or. So I generally put them in the more severe category if you've got one, one thing of one and one thing of the other. So I go for sort of the more severe. Um, and then sort of severe is pH of less than uh, 7.1 or a bicarb of less than five. Um, and for sort of calculating fluids, so our protocol suggests, so mild, we assume a 5% dehydration, moderate a 7, and severe is a 10%. Although the recent updates uh, on the um, best, uh, base bed um, sort of now treat mild and moderate as both 5% rather than 5 and 7. So then, so the first decision, so obviously, so I've got them in recess, um, gained your access, got your gas off and confirmed your diagnosis. Um, which is brilliant. So then you, you sort of first decision about management wise is to assess if they're shocked. Um, so the features that would be looking for sort of tachycardic, delayed cap refill, weak pulses. If you're getting to the point of hypertension in the child, it's a very late sign. So they'll maintain their blood pressure right up until they're sort of almost peri arrest. Um, so it's sort of assessing these together and sort of making a decision if you think they're shocked or not. So if uh, we're concerned that they are shocked. What we need to do is um, to give a fluid bolus. Um, so sort of what we what we sort of suggest is um, a ten ml per kilo bolus of normal saline over fifteen minutes and reassess. Our guideline does suggest uh, twenty mils per kilo, but uh, it'd be better to give it in smaller aliquots and then sort of can basically reassess and give more if needed. Um, if they're not shocked and you think they're otherwise sort of okay, um, then all of them will get a 10 mil per kilo bolus sort of anyway, but it'd just be given over an hour instead of 15, um, 15 minutes. Fine. So I've just got a picture here. So this is our 
sort of recess here from Pede's side. So obviously we've got our notice board and you can see just where that big arrow is. That's where we normally keep our performer. Uh, and this here on the right, is just what it looks like. Um, so it's quite, quite busy on there, but it's relatively straightforward. So you can work your way through that um, and it just gives you any prompts that you need and just important bits to assess as you're going along. Uh, this is a sort of next page. So it's just sort of going through about um, sort of shocked or not shocked patients. And it's just where you sort of document um, as you go. From um, a bowler, so it does say uh, there, you know, from a weight point of view, because obviously you're doing 10 per kilo. Um, here it says 80 kilos is your maximum for a child, but uh, they've reduced that now to 75. So the maximum bowler you should be doing is 750 mils, which is still quite a lot for a, for a kid. Um, and that's so. Uh, and then the rest just goes through working out sort of your fluid as you're sort of ongoing. So all your kids come in, we've sort of confirmed the diagnosis, let paediatrics know um, from that side. We've given them the fluid bolus either as they're shocked or not shocked. Um, and then after that has gone through, we need to then look at ongoing fluids. Hopefully by this point, you might have the paediatricians down, which case they'll take over all this and, and sort it out. Um, but if not, if we, you know, if they're sort of tied up somewhere, then we'll probably need to start these fluids uh, ongoing. Um, so they are prone to errors. So whenever I've seen people do this, you always need someone to second check it because it's quite a lot of calculations and there's been quite a few times where I've seen people um, go wrong on these. Uh, and it just creates a little bit of faff later on. Um, and basically, the idea is that we work out how much sort of fluid deficit they've got, and that's just going back to sort of the severity, so either five or 10%, and working that out as sort of a volume. Um, we sort of replace that over 48 hours rather than acutely, sort of in the first 24, um, just because that reduces the risk of going into cerebral edema. Um, if they are sort of when well, if they weren't shocked, we would sort of take that bolus off that total um, sort of deficit, just so we don't give them too much fluid. It's one of these ones that um, is best just to work through the performer and sort of. Um, if you look there on the right, um, you can see it's basically sort of got all the different bits of calculations, and it sort of follows through quite nicely with colours to allow you to work through. Um, I generally try and do this a little bit away from patient just so that then you can get that little bit of time just to make sure you get it all right. Um, after the initial sort of uh, bolus, then we put them on um, sort of normal saline with potassium because we know there's a risk of them dropping their uh, potassium levels as we start to introduce insulin and treat them. So the only times you wouldn't put potassium in any fluids would be if they're hyperkalemic, so that's basically anything above our upper normal limit, if they've got ECG changes or if we think they might be aneuric. Obviously, we won't know exactly if they're going to pass urine or not, but generally sort of it's a little bit of clinical judgment there. So most people will get the um, potassium, but just a few things to consider before we do give it. Fine. So we've continued our sort of fluids going through, we've given our boluses, then it's sort of looking at starting insulin. So insulin, we always start that after an hour of fluid resuscitation. Um, if you give it earlier than that, there's been um, linked with that increase in your risk of developing cerebral edema. So starting rate is at 0.05 or 0.1 units per kilo per hour. In most cases, we'll go for 0.05. And the times you'd consider going for a higher sort of initial rate would be sort of the adolescents, so when they're sort of approaching adult age, or sometimes um, in sort of the more severe DKs, you might do that. But generally, I'd go for 0 0.05. Um, so once we've got all the sort of initial bits in, so we've got our fluids running, we've got our insulin up um, from that side. Uh, hopefully paediatricians will come down and sort of start to take over from this point. Um, but things we just need to be aware of is um, at two hours after sort of treatment, they'll need just a recheck of their UNEs, blood gas and ketones. And that will just allow us to assess how we're getting on sort of treatment wise. We probably wouldn't expect to see huge changes, 
but just to ensure we're, we're sort of not causing any problems such as pushing them hyper or anything. So once their blood sugar starts to, to drop um, and hits less than 14, that's when we'll start to add uh, dextrose to the fluid. So they end up with dexaline sort of running from that point with the potassium in it still. Um, all of these kids will need to go to HDU as a minimum, just from a monitoring point of view. So um, just given that they have the regular blood sugar monitoring and it's sort of a more of a nursing input uh, once they're starting to stabilise. So if you're at Bassett Law, they're going to have to be transferred. Um, if you're at Doncaster, hopefully we should have beds. And normally they're quite good for, for sort of moving them around on the water to make space for these, if not. Um, so kids to worry about. So. So most of them will probably be sort of all right, and they're ones that you can sort of correct quite quickly. The times to be sort of concerned are the ones that have potential to deteriorate. Um, so reduce level of consciousness on the tendon. So if they're sort of drowsy or a little bit strained, these are the ones I've seen um, that sort of go off and potentially will deteriorate. So the more severe the DK, the sort of the greater risk um, that they can develop complications, and particularly sort of the young children with a new diagnosis. So less than two will just generally have a bit more of a severe disease. Um, and the new diagnoses will probably present a little bit later than the uh, children who have diabetes and just are starting to run high, purely because from a monitoring point of view, you'd hope that um, your known diabetics would pick up their sugars are going up. Um, so cerebral edema. So I'm just going to go through this a little bit. So this is the sort of main complication that we worry about uh, in DK. Uh, from that side. So it's not sort of fully understood uh, exactly about who will develop it and or why they get it. But generally, it's thought to be um, due to an osmolar gradient. So as you correct the blood sugar and um, the osmotic potential from that goes down as the sugars start to, to improve. Um, and that basically causes a concentration gradient, which then causes a shift of fluid and gets the cerebral edema. Um, when it does develop, it has got quite a high mortality, so 20 to 50 percent. And, you know, in kids, that's something that, you know, which we do worry about quite a bit. Um, so treatment wise, so with these, it's always sort of escalate early um, because these have got the potential just to continue dropping their, their GCS. Um, so treatment wise, so hypertonic saline would be first line, um, so 2.7 or 3% and give five mils per kilo over 15 minutes. If you've got the performer, it's all in there. So, you know, don't expect to remember any of this, but just know that it's all, all be there so, to use if needed. Um, if you can't get hold of the hypertonic saline, then you can give mannitol at um, 2.5 mils per kilo over 20%. Um, you'll want to slow their fluids down so the rest of their sort of maintenance and sort of correcting their deficit. Um, it's advisable then if you're at that point of view um, to sort of get intensive care involved uh, because if we've got a fall in GCS or sort of the headaches, confusion, agitation, then uh, whether they're going to end up being tubed um, for either transfer or going around for CT. Um, the CT is more just to exclude any other pathology, because as we mentioned earlier, um, sort of triggers could be things like infection or anything else sort of going on. So it's just looking at excluding any other diagnoses about what's the what's causing the drop in in the GCS. Um, from that side, I've seen you know a few where they've had sort of issues and they've been concerned from cerebral edema points. And generally these are the ones where they've come in as a more severe DK, so sort of pH is less than seven, um, and who already sort of had a little bit of a fluctuating GCS on the first presentation. So that's why just they're the ones to be a little bit worried about. Um, other bits just that I'd say just to be aware of and sort of note. So with our guidelines, there's a discrepancy between um, sort of the up-to-date ones and what we've got. Um, and, you know, I don't think they'll make a huge difference in what, what we'd get uh, outcome-wise, but I think it'd be worth just being aware of them because you might find that um, when the paediatricians come down, if they're working on a slightly different guideline, that it might just uh, change things slightly um, and get different calculations from fluids, which is okay. Um, 
instrument bumps. So if they do have one, uh, it's best to turn them off because obviously whatever reason they've got um, going into DK, their pumps obviously not working adequately enough. And what we don't want to do is get varying, varying levels of insulin going in that we can't control uh, initially. Uh, any long acting insulin that they're on, um, we'd want to continue just because that will enable them to come off the um, sort of variable rate outside the scale later on uh, a bit easier. So 16 to 18 year olds are a little bit of a, a grey area. Um, so we can go either way on them and it depends a little bit on our clinical judgment. So generally if they're um, under 18 but over 16 and they're known to pedi pediatrics and haven't been transitioned, they'll go under pediatrics. If we're going to send them to peds, we probably need to treat them on the peds pathway, just as when I've spoken to a few of my friends as registrars and from peds point, um, if they've been treated as adults, they don't really know where to go because they're not familiar with that. Um, from that point, um, fine. And then finally, that's just a link there. So if you, you know, when the slides come on, if you have a little look through or just type into Google, you can have a little look at their DKA proforma. Um, it's very similar to ours, it puts, so it seems almost a little bit more user friendly from that side. So I would recommend having a look through just so we know, know where we are from that point. Um, so I think that's pretty much sort of most of it sort of going through quickly. So the main things are sort of getting the diagnosis confirmed early, sort of escalating to paediatrics and sort of seniors uh, quickly. So sort of initially starting with the fluid uh, sort of bolus as treatment and then delaying sort of starting the insulin after they've had that, that hour's worth of fluid going through um, from that point. And I think that's pretty much it. Anyone got any questions or? Tom, can you explain a little bit about this cerebral edema due to the gradient, uh, you know, uh, osmolar gradient of the treatment? So treatment wise, yeah. So uh, basically you've got sort of two options in with regards to treatment. So no, one... no, Tom, as a course, Cause for it that uh, the first line you said about the osmolar gradient uh, due to treatment. Yeah. So yeah, so they think it's um yeah with the osmolar gradient. So what they think is that obviously um when you've got sugar anywhere, it uh, will basically sort of suck water towards it. Um, so that's sort of what, you know, when we're trying to reduce like, um, you know, paraphimosis, we put the 50% dextrose on to sort of suck the fluid out. So when they've been at home in sort of before coming in and their sugars have been sort of high 20s, um, that will sort of diffuse across. So uh, intracranially, sort of in the brain tissue, their blood sugars will be about 20 um, or, or sort of plus really. They also think there might be an element of a sort of protective factor, which basically ensures that they get good perfusion to the brain um, and sort of good um, sort of water delivery to the brain as well, which they're not sure what causes it. But basically it's in sort of a situation where it's coping with having to sort of draw more water to itself and to sort of keep ticking over. Then when your sort of free water increases and your osmolarity in your uh, sort of serum drops, it basically creates a diffusion gradient. So before you'd be sort of in an equilibrium uh, between your serum and your sort of intracranial tissue. And then what you find is as your blood sugar drops um, down, the water will move from your serum into your tissues. Um, and that will get sort of a cerebral um, edema and sort of develop that swelling. Yeah, I think I think the other okay. other thing is like uh, we have a concept of autoregulation uh, in uh, different organs, and the brain also have got autoregulation mechanism. Uh, I think the autoregulation happen in the blood pressure of sixty to one hundred and sixty. I'm not sure about peds uh, how much the blood pressure range, but in adult one hundred sixty to one hundred sixty. So once the blood pressure is, um, you know, on these both extremes, 
below or above, then the autoregulation is disturbed. And there's a concept of cerebral perfusion pressure as well. Uh, you know, so the, uh, uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure is uh, what they call uh, mean blood pressure minus by, you know, the intracranial pressure. So the mean blood pressure, I under, uh, remember, is calculated as systolic blood pressure plus twice the diastolic and divided by, I think, three. And then, uh, you know, that's the mean artery pressure, then the minus the intracranial pressure, which is about 13 or something. And that gives you um, uh, figures which you can see whether the autoregulation has disturbed or not. So once the autoregulation is disturbed, either very low blood pressure, very high blood pressure, then, uh, you know, the cerebral, chances of cerebral edema developing increase. And also, Tom is saying is uh, a major part is played by the, uh, you know, the uh, smaller gradient as well. Uh, hence, uh, insulin is not given in kids, uh, you know, uh, early on. So we wait for the treatment for one hour uh, because the main function of insulin is to push glucose into the cells. So once the glucose is pushed in the cells, so the cell osmolality will be up and any more. And with suck the fluid, the cell will suck the fluid, they swell up and cause all the trouble. I think uh, there's no definite uh, answer to that, but um, you know, these two mechanisms can explain you know, more fluid in the brain and causing cerebral edema. Uh, I mean, I mean, in our trust, uh, you know, we didn't have this uh, uh, pathway until I think uh, it was about oh, how many, a couple of years ago when Amjad was our CD and then uh, we started looking into the pathways, we set up my ED and then there was, um, you know, email forth and back from the pediatric. So we have a considerable pain taking experience in setting up the DK protocol. I think is uh, is good apart from these a few differences, the local differences. And Tom is absolutely right. You know, uh, we need to involve pediatric because uh, the fluid calculation and the DK management children quite different than adults. And uh, you know, the more fluid in lead to cerebral edema, which is quite nasty in a fatal condition. Uh, I think uh, yeah, Peter, this was a very good presentation and uh, relevant to the department. I think. Uh, I, I like that um, idea that, uh, you know, you have uh, gone to the resource and took pictures and uh, done the research, what is resource available currently in, in our uh, department. I think that that's very, very good touch, you know, very practical touch. Yeah, well done, Tom. Uh, thanks very much for this nice presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. So if we don't have any questions, so we can end the meeting here. Yeah, one thing, Sundar, yeah, you are a good moderator. You've done uh, a, a good job, believe me, you know. So well done. Yeah, we must appreciate that one as well. And, you know, these the, that's precisely this, this program is about, you know, getting uh, skills and, you know, uh, non-technical skills because uh, you know we are all doctors you know yeah. so being doctor we are doctors but that thing make make bit make difference really so well done you know everybody should come forth and uh, do these set of presentation and moderation and stuff like that uh, you know and uh, you know I mean you, it's, it's, it's amazing you know Tom presentation absolutely amazing it's really impressive stuff happening oh we are making history guys I can tell you that <laughs> Well done, guys. Okay, thank you, man.